welcome to our LMU Business Insights webinar series. I feel like you guys should all know me by now, but just in case, my name is Nola Wanta and I'm the Senior Director of Business Development and Strategy at the College of Business Administration at LMU. Uh, so our LMU Business Insights webinar series is aligned with our mission to advance knowledge and develop business leaders with moral courage and creative confidence to be a force for good for the business and global community. Before we get started, I'd like to quickly go over some of our guidelines for today's webinar. So uh, you should already be at speaker view and um, you can adjust your view when we share screen at the top right hand of your screen. Uh, type your questions in the Q&A window. These questions will be moderated after the presentations. Um, so we are just monitoring the Q&A window. So please use the chat window to post your insights or comments um, during the webinar. And as a friendly reminder, this webinar is being recorded and will be available after the presentation. So we are proud to bring you our fifth installment of our sixth part marketing injection series hosted by our M School. And to introduce today's talk, um, I'd like to introduce our two wonderful co-directors of the M School, Professors Andrew Rome and Matt Steffel. Thank you, Nola. Good morning, Matt. Good morning. Andy, I read this morning that the world is getting less gassy. You hear that? <laughs> the International Energy Agency, aka the IEA, forecasts that we've hit our peak in terms of gasoline and oil consumption, and it's all downhill from here. Wow, the IEA, impressive, smarty pants. But you're right, I've been riding my bike more during COVID. So I'd like to feel I've contributed to this declining gassiness in some little way, which brings us to our fifth in our six parts Corona, C-O-R-O-N-A series. So in last week's episode, number four, Dietmar talked about the second O in Corona, offline moves online. We'll drop the link in the chat in case you missed it. Today, in the fifth episode of our six-part series, Dmar is going to talk about how the multiple global lockdowns have allowed Mother Nature to replenish and recharge. A brilliant creator and strategist who's led some of the world's leading agencies, including BBDNO and Olga Viena, who spreads his awesomeness as a professional speaker, executive trainer, coach, and consultant for transformation adaptation, innovation, and disruptive marketing strategies, broadcasting live from Vienna, Austria, one of our most favorite people of all time, Dietmar Dahmen. Hello, everybody. Again, I'm super excited that you are with me all the way in Los Angeles, all the way in a different time zone, but we are connected here via the internet. And I will now share my screen so that we can actually dive into today's session. So I hope you see the screen. This is, of course, the Corona What's Next webinar. And it started all with C, chaos leads to creativity and innovation. We heard that most of this creativity and innovation actually happens online. And we learned that everything that is online can be done by robots and automation as long as it's clean data functioning in a clean environment. If it's getting a little bit messy, humans are really good at being uh, at dealing with messiness. So the human job is to actually uh, get us, <laughs> the human job is actually to understand messiness, to deal with messiness and to have robots and machines just do the functionality. This will stay with us for a very, very long time. We also learned that while most people know that artificial intelligence might actually uh, improve the quality of a, a certain service, like for instance, a call center, still most people, over 80% of the people prefer to talk to a human. So machines are functional, but humans are cool. And that's the most important thing. And the next, last part, we heard that the coolness is often very, uh, is often created online and that experience is displacing material goods as the most important product of the 21st century and that most of this experience is actually created offline. We talked about the universe of experiences and we said that you are in the center of this universe as a university, as a brand, as a company. And all the other things are moving around you and you have to actually give gravity to all of this. You have to have heavyweight uh, experiences with heavyweight 
speakers, heavyweight information, heavyweight everything. And you also have to have an infrastructure that is probably steered by digital things like artificial intelligence and online to actually create the space time of this universe. We talked about the offline power and the universe, and on the other hand, the online power. We talked about the functionality, especially AI driven, uh, information driven, uh, um, back end of uh, the information driven back end of society and we talked about the emotion which is the uh, front end of society uh, of <laughs> events sorry <laughs> so the back end is function the front end is emotion and this would stay for us and this all thing happens mainly offline and the biggest thing offline obviously is our planet our planet is offline and our planet is full of nature, or well, that's what's supposed to be there. We now notice there is not always nature, there's actually catastrophe, and that created an amazing urgency. Urgency is a really, really good driver, if you remember. If every, anything is urgent, if there's a big pain, we come up with big solutions and we come up with big change. And the urgency of our planet heating up is very, very dramatic. Our planet is heating up like a frog in hot water constantly over the time. This is data from the last uh, 100 years. And as you can see, red will be uh, hot and green is not so hot. The planet is getting hotter and hotter and hotter all the time. We are now seeing a new temperature record every year. Every year it's hot, hotter than the year before. And we see a weather crisis every year. Look how red it is compared to 100 years ago. This is completely human made and the effects are dramatic. We have not rain, but rain bombs, amazing floods all over the place. Just look in the news and you will read about floods in all over the world. We don't have regular fires. We have fire storms. You live in California. Unbelievable. The burn, the entire state was burning. This is incredible. And on the cold end of the spectrum, we have mega melts. Even the ice is melting. And this is very, very dramatic. So the urgency is there. The pain is there. The need to act is there. And thank God there's also a tailwind. The tailwind pushes the market forward and we have an amazing increase in the sales of sustainable product. If you compare it even in the last couple of years from 2014 to now, you see how the curve is going up. There's research that says that 71% of millennials are willing to change their diet and eat less meat and more vegetables to reduce impact on the planet. It used to be about my personal health, or it was to be to care just about some specific aspect of the planet, like an animal species. But now it is also realized that this impacts the entire planet if you stop eating meat and you go vegan or vegetarian, or even if you only do it a couple of times a week. And most people, most millennials are willing to do that. We see on the marketing end, you know, on the sales end, an 80% growth in products that are healthy, organic, better for you and the planet. This is a major, major tailwind. If you have the same product and one is fair trade and good for the planet and the other isn't, and if the price is kind of comparable, we will go for the one that is healthy, organic, and better for you. And not only if the price is compatible, a lot of people are willing to pay more for a better product. And this is beautiful. And in Germany, right next to Austria, where I live, we the Germans uh, are ready to demand water in glass bottles. 85% of Germans want their water in a glass bottle. They don't care if you just change your factory and just a couple of years ago moved from glass to PET or whatever. They don't care about things like that. They say, I want glass now and you should deliver it. You have to perform because the customer delivers. The tailwind is humongous. So we have an amazingly strong tailwind. We have an amazingly noticeable urgency and we are seeing that the people are actually acting on this we have an amazingly strong force where the sustainable product sales goes up like crazy do the actions work does this work where's the effect we just heard about that the peak of uh, fossil fuels is reached when will the planet will be better 
Well, in fact, it would take very, very long. It works very, very, very slowly. This is what we used to say before Corona. But when Corona hit, we noticed that when we drastically stop everything, when we cut down on planes, when we don't drive that much anymore, when we stop those things, the change is very, very dramatic to see and it's very, very clear. The uh, dolphins came back to Istanbul, the jellyfish and regular fish came back to the lagoon of Venice and even the canals of Venice. We saw cleaner air and all those kinds of things. And we noticed the thing that will last probably longer and that is a fast change of attitude. I already said, that a lot of people are pro-organic food and stuff like that. But Corona made this trend faster and much more drastic. 70% of people are now aware, more, than, more aware now than before Corona, that human activity threatens the climate and that the environmental degradation can threaten humans. Before, before that, a lot of people did not agree to the statement. Now they saw the impact and they absolutely agree. 70% are aware of this. 40% say they want to integrate sustainable behavior into their daily business. 70% say that economic recovery should include the environment. In the US and especially in Europe, there's a lot of financing done by the government in order to help uh, entities like the aviation and industry, airlines and stuff like that. And there is now a strong link. We give you money if you move much faster into electric uh, aviation. And the, mo the, mo the motion towards electric aviation is gigantic. And as you might know already in the US there and, and Canada, I think there are small uh, airlines with small aircraft that already fly on electricity. So it's an amazing part. And we notice that sustainability is part of your everyday experience, uh, even if you just experience a brand. If the brand is eco-friendly, like Patagonia, Beyond Meat and stuff like that, then you are eco-friendly because the brand is the mirror in which you see yourself. And then you feel good. And then your friends see that you are good because the brand is also the mirror in which the friend sees you. So it's a win, 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 win situation. It's a total upgrade for your emotional well-being, for, the, for the, your self-image, for the image that your friends have about you. And it's a great thing. And a lot of people invest into this. So how do you do this? How do you actually incorporate sustainable thinking into your business? The first thing is very, very simple. You need to identify potential sustainability problems in your business. First, always get rid of the problems. And then when the problems, when the, the path is clear and the problems are gone, then you can actually use the path to a better world. But first, clear the path. That means if you have plastic coffee cups to go in your business or in the university, get rid of it. If there is a potential, if you go to a store that has plastic coffee cups, tell them to get rid of it. If you have a choice to use a plastic coffee cup or bring your own mug, bring your own mug. Get rid of those things. If you do not have a hookup for e-mobility in your university, in your business, in the apartment where you, where you live, demand one. Get one. A hookup for e-mobility is very, very mandatory because otherwise you cannot have an e-mobility car and even e-bikes and stuff like that need to recharge at one point. If you don't have a gray water system where the waste of the shower and the washing machine is used for the toilet and stuff like that, get one. Demand that your company does it, the university does it, the apartment you live in does it. And if you don't have green roofing, again, demand it make a little uh, group that demands green roofing. Those are very, very simple things. They're working all over the place. In Austria right now, every new building has to have green roofing and a gray water system and um, a hookup for e-mobility. Every new um, bus stop has green roofing and stuff like that. That's really, really vital, especially in cities because then the insects can live there. They can only hop from one green roof to the next and stuff like that. Demand those things, solve those problems. Once those problems are solved, then you can identify potential sustainability drivers in your business and you can bank with them, right? Sharing stuff is really good. 
You can, if you have already e-mobility, why not share the car and share e-mobility? Recycling is really important. Try to recycle whatever you have. Don't, if you are a company, don't produce future waste. Don't produce something that you cannot recycle. Make sure that recycling is easy and it's cost efficient. That is very, very mon mon uh, mandatory. If you are a huge corporation, like a university, fitness club, whatever, get free e-bikes. If you're a city or a state or the government, try to become CO2 neutral. Those things are very important. And once you reach it, celebrate those drivers. I'm going to give a talk uh, in a couple of weeks, actually, in Norway and then in Denmark. And Copenhagen, which is a city in Denmark, is CO2 neutral. They are celebrating this like crazy. Everybody knows this. It's a reason for people to go visit the city. The interesting thing about what I just said about becoming CO2 neutral, becoming, doing the green roofing and stuff like that, is you, that you might say, why, how can I do that? I'm just a regular person. And that is not just you thinking this, it is everybody thinking it. Most of us want others to act. 87% of the people expect that the brands do it for them. 87% of the people expect that Starbucks removes plastic cups, that McDonald's gets rid of plastic straws, that it's done by the other person, but not by them. This is convenient and the most amazing driver of them all, laziness. We learned about this before, and this is happening in sustainability as well. But there are people that are actually acting like superheroes, and there are various entities, and the fight against climate change is being fought everywhere. Number one, the government. The government is doing everything it can, right? We're boosting EU's green recovery because in, by investing over a billion euros in innovative clean technology, uh, there's like, like money for uh, hybrid and e-vehicles. The US just rejoined again the Paris Climate Agreement. All those things are happening on a government level. This is fantastic, but it is not an easy fight, especially in the US. If you look at the United Nations climate change circle, you will see that transportation, which is on the left, upper left side, is the biggest factor by far. It's the biggest factor by far. And all this is created by oil. So oil is the most important and the, uh, the most important uh, entity that causes climate change. It's oil. But oil has a very, very strong lobby, especially in the US. We all know about the power of the gun lobby, but if the gun lobby is one, the oil lobby is 10. The 10 oil lobby has 10 times more money, 10 times more people than the gun lobby. It's an amazingly strong force and we need to fight that. And you need to fight that and you need to make sure that the government stays to the promises and actually is not influenced by the oil companies. That's number one. Number two is science. If you look at the uh, cell, solar, solar cell conversion efficiency rate, you see that it increased dramatically. The old numbers are just not even 10 years ago. It's from 2013. But from 2013 to now, we really, really increased the cell conversion and the efficiency of solar cells increased dramatically. This has a major impact on the efficiency of solar cells. And it also has a major impact on the market. And the market forces are really, really strong. Look at how cheap the cost of solar now became. Solar in many countries is now the cheapest form of electricity. Solar is the cheapest electricity in history, even confirms the IEA. And this is very, very attractive to the next superhero, the consumer. The consumer is buying into this trend. The consumer is demanding regular products to be sustainable. We heard about the glass. We heard about the organics. We heard about local and stuff like that. But also the big things like electric car registration is up like crazy. The trend is accelerating like a jockey stick. It's absolutely fantastic. The electric cars in Norway are now 54% of the market share. So the regular car is an electric car. And Norway is just at the front of the trend and we will all pick up. It's unbelievable. And finally, after the government, after the science, 
after the consumer and the market forces, businesses are acting as well. If you look at the oil companies, the oil polluters, Shell used to be one of those. And Shell is now the first company that links executive pay to carbon emission. If you lower carbon emission, you get a bonus. If you don't lower it, you don't get a bonus. A lot of people don't put the money where the word is. They would say, yeah, let's reduce carbon emissions, but you get a bonus for an increase in market share or something like that. Not so with Shell. Shell is the first company that actually puts the money where the, word, where the mouth is and rewards the people that lower carbon emission. There's a lot of hotel companies that are now getting rid of those mini toiletries we all used to see when we go to a hotel. And Holiday Inn, for instance, removed all those mini toiletries and uh, replaced them with big ones, reducing waste dramatically. Adidas tested to sell uh, shoes that were made from ocean plastic. And this test was so successful, they are going further making more models, investing more money in it. It's a huge, huge thing. And this thing is noticed finally, finally, finally also by nature. The power of nature is actually kicking back stronger than we expected. We all thought it might take many, many years, but we see that dramatic actions can lead to dramatic results relatively quickly. The biggest carbon dioxide drop in real time happened when COVID uh, stopped everything and COVID had a massive impact on global emissions. Everything is back. It is now that there's a lot less emissions. And in Los Angeles, for instance, the sky was clear like it has never been in, in the last couple of years. Uh, that was amazing. But this was only a short time because it was just the impact of stopping flights, stopping cars, stopping emissions. But still the underlying trend, the long trend of the curve is still happening. And that's why five months later, California was burning and the San Francisco sky looked like that. So don't rest. You cannot stop if you're a superhero. You need to keep fighting. If you identify the problem, be that a train track, a train falling off track or a planet falling off track, you have to see that problem and you have to act. If you are the superhero, you don't say, oh no, someone should do something. Somebody should help. Don't do that. Don't say that. Say we do it. Don't wait for the others to help. Don't wait for the government, the businesses to do something. You are the consumer and you should do it. And then you do it and you fly to the problem and you save the world and you do it over and over again. And best, as we heard, a big, bold, decisive actions like smashing CO2, getting CO2 neutral, killing coal is very, very important. Killing all coal and fossil oil, getting rid of all this stuff that is burning fossil fuel, get rid of that stuff and start to plant tree. That's really, really good. But big, bold actions actually are one thing. And on the other side, you have many, many tiny steps. And tiny steps can have a huge impact. If you, as a single person, start to eat less meat, that already has an impact. If you, as a single person, start to repair and recycle, it has an impact. If you buy less new stuff and buy more used stuff, it has an impact. The impact of tiny steps is unbelievable. There's the chart that if you just are 1% better each day, by the end of the year, you will be 30 times better. And if you're 1% worse each day, by the end of the year, you will have 0.03% of what you achieved at the beginning of the year. The difference is dramatic. So even tiny steps have amazing impact. Every single one of us can save the world. But it often takes time. So if you were to produce electric cars from today on only, and none of the cars that were new and uh, on the market would be uh, driven with fossil fuels and combustion engines, it would still take over 10 years till the entire fleet is electric. And that is because of the cycle, the life cycle of things. Building appliances and cars, 10 to 15 to 20 years. 
So if every refrigerator is now CO2 neutral, still we will have CO2 non-neutral refrigerators still in 2035. If every car is electric, still we have non-electric cars in 2020, in 2035. You need to move decisively, but still there is a long cycle. So you have to give an incentive to get rid of the polluting products, not only get the new into the market, but also get the old out of the market. Industrial equipment even takes 30 years, power plants, 60 years, buildings, hundreds of years, urban forms, hundreds of years. It, everything takes a long, long time. So what can you do? Or what can we do? And who is we? We is you. We just said that before. Only you can do that. So the thing in the last two minutes or four minutes is very, very simple. What you need to do is you set yourself a goal. And that goal is to save the planet. Then you measure your action. If you don't measure, you don't know which way you're going. If you just have a goal and hope you're achieving it, you will never achieve it. And my trick is very, very simple. Just make a scale from minus five, which is negative, to plus five, which is positive, and say, the actions I did today will save the planet. Ask that question at the end of every day, right before you go to bed. And then just in general, mark where you think you are. If you are in the positive thing because you did not take the plastic cup, just say, yeah, I think it was a positive three. It was great, right? If you're in the negative thing because you were tempted and actually got a coffee with the plastic lid <laughs> on top of it, then just mark it negative something, right? Ask yourself every day, how good were you or how bad were you? And if you're still in the, in the positive, that's good. If you're in the negative, that's negative. And if you're by zero, it's negative also. Because if you do nothing, your actions don't match your goal. Add the things up at the end of the month to find out what you did and what you achieved. Your job in the world of sustainability is to be an action hero. And an action hero keeps fighting. The moment of job done will never happen. You have to do it over and over and over again. Thank you very much. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dietmar. We've got some questions that have come in. And so um, just as a reminder for everyone, please do type in your questions in the Q&A and we'll be sure to read them out. Um, Professor Rome, I do see that you had a question. Did you want to ask it directly or do you want me to? Oh, I have one question. Uh, oops, I have a question. Oh, is it yes. till 2015 or till 2030? Oh, maybe because I, I still have a couple of slides left. I was wondering if I was too fast. No, you were great. We still okay. have time if you'd like to. Ah, okay, 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 good, good, good. So let's do the questions. Yeah, perfect. Oh, okay. Uh, unless you want to do your slides. Um, no, no, let's do the question and then we will okay. see and maybe we, we can do All slides. Right. Sounds afterwards. good. Sounds good. Um, Andy, do you oh, want to ask your question? Yeah, I'll ask it. So Dietmar, imagine you were back at BBDNO or Ogilvy as creative director yeah. um, and recognizing how people, especially in the US, are kind of science deniers, like we don't believe it or we don't want to believe what's happening with the client or with the climate. What would be your creative strategy to convince, like in a public service campaign, to convince us um, to reduce our own individual carbon footprints. And maybe it ties to your action hero theme. I, I think the, uh, the, the trick here is that convincing sounds a little bit like a rational argument. And uh, I think that rationality always just leads to conclusions. I should do this. I should actually not get the plastic coffee cup, but it's so convenient, I do it anyway. And the only trick is to emotionalize the subject. So if you actually create an emotional campaign where the people feel emotionally driven, if you, for instance, say instead of sustainability that the planet is a little baby and you have to care for this little baby because if you kick it, then it's really, really bad. That's an emotional approach. So I think the trick is to actually create an emotional campaign where the people emotionally identify with the globe. And I think that especially young people and millennials actually achieve that, that a lot of people in, in, in that age group are willing to sacrifice things in order to show the care for the planet. It's more about caring than about taking. Thank you. 
Wonderful. So I'm just going to take some of the questions from our Q&A. Lance, thanks for your question. As the U.S. is in other countries open up, do you think there will be a focus of environment-friendly environment, environment -friendly methods, or will these countries just focus on bringing back their economy as quickly as possible? Um, as I said, there's actually data from the, the data I, sh I shared was from the EU, and uh, there's a huge uh, push towards uh, a, a greener recovery. There's a huge push for companies to actually change and not just bring back the old. The old is gone. And if you look at anything, you study business, right? If you look at any business theory, at any economic theory, the economic theory always wants to create a better life, a better planet, something that is better for us. There's no economic theory that says, I have an idea, I make it worse, right? That won't work. And everybody now understands that the big picture of a better life includes a better planet. There's a thing in the handout that you will get that says that a lot of people are uh, actually ready now to understand what is called the one health view. One health view means if you are healthy, in order for you to be healthy, the planet has to be healthy. Because maybe coronavirus came because of the lack uh, of the loss of the environment and that species were forced out of the habitat and actually crossed over to the human habitat. So the coronavirus might actually be the result of somebody chopping off a tree somewhere or a bunch of trees somewhere and getting rid of an environment of some species. So one health is really, really important and people are starting to do that. So the answer is yes, the higher developed nations will definitely demand a greener future, and they definitely demand that the recovery is towards a greener uh, lifestyle. I have a question for Dimar. Oh, yes. Yeah. Can I jump in? Um, so we live in a price sensitive um, consumer culture. So we are the machine, you know, that people buying stuff drives the machine. Um, our corporate culture demands constant growth. The, their flat is flat as dead, right? Always be growing. Is conscious consumption at odds with predictable corporate growth? Uh, yes, and the thing is that what is happening now is that the uh, if you look at the drivers to buy something, price is now at least in the developed world is getting lower and lower and lower and lower. We already have 20, 30, 40 t-shirts. We don't need 50, 60, 80. We already have those things. Uh, I also do a lot of stuff uh, for the fashion industry and in the fashion industry, the movement towards slow fashion rather than fast fashion, towards buying something that is more valuable, more costly, but uh, produced in a much more environmentally friendly way and actually also lasts longer is growing and growing and growing. Uh, used stores and, and uh, recycling and upcycling are dramatically growing. In Europe, for instance, the younger kids don't necessarily buy their stuff at Zara and H&M, which are fast fashion stores. They actually go to the used store and get a used Prada sweater. And then they say, I can wear Prada, I can wear Gucci, I can wear all those kinds of things. It might be a little bit more expensive, but it's way cheaper than a new one, especially if you go not to secondhand, but thirdhand store stores and stuff like that, and it's cooler. So there's a humongous trend. And again, just like you said, the consumer drives this trend. That's why it is highly important that every single decision you do as a consumer is an investment. Either you go to the coffee shop that has a plastic cup, then you invest in the plastic cup, or you go to the coffee shop where you bring your own cup or the people that recycle the cup, then you invest in that. So you are the superhero, you have to act. Thank you, Deedmar. I'd like to read a question from the Q&A, and this is from our very own Dean, Dr. Dale Smith. Uh, Deedmar, do you envision the CSO or Chief Sustainability Officer becoming more prevalent as a strategic role and not just a nice to have, but actually an integral, integral part of uh, ESG? Absolutely. Uh, depending on whether we have time to go through the rest of the slides or not, uh, I will the, those will, that question will be answered potentially in the slides, but I, I'm happy to give an answer right now. Any change always starts at the fringes. If you look at Tesla, which is now the most successful 
uh, car company in the world, right? It has more money than BMW and Mercedes and Jeep and stuff like that. And Elon Musk is one of the, or the richest person in the world currently. He started with fringe markets. Tesla used to be a brand for some weirdos in California. The big brands ignored that. The big brands said, no, I concentrate on the mass market. I concentrate on huge volume. That's where the future is. However, the small, that's why the, the, the reason uh, that the big brands ignored that helped the small brand Tesla to grow. And it could actually build a fan case and it could build followers and it grew and grew and grew. And then at one point, it became a little bit more serious and the big brands started to notice. And then the big brands said, yeah, we have to act, but they didn't put power into the action. They acted half ass, as we say, right? They didn't really good, put enough energy into catching up with the development. And that's why the big brands actually lost in terms of learning curve. They, they were always behind Tesla because Tesla was way ahead with the current learning curve. And because it was ahead with the learning curve, it was ahead with the product, it was ahead with what it could deliver, and it get great, gained more and more and more uh, followers. And at one point right now, Tesla is the major player. So the former French product is now the major player. And the major player becomes a French product. The major player becomes somebody, who, uh, I don't know, some crazy person who still wants to drive a combustion engine Hummer or something like that is very, very, very rare to the person who prefers a Tesla. So the market completely shifted and the disruption is complete. And this means that sustainability as a subject that is started as a fringe market where some weird hippies wanted to eat organic and local and stuff like that is becoming more and more mainstream. And every supermarket, every brand, everybody has to now follow this trend because the consumer demands that. And the person who is responsible for this brand is the chief sustainability officer. And that means that if you have a weak chief sustainability officer who just speaks and doesn't put action to, to his or her words, the brand is hollow and the people will notice that and you will die. But if you have a strong one like Patagonia, for instance, where everybody knows, oh my God, you really stand for sustainability, that helps the brand grow. So I absolutely think that the chief sustainable officer has an amazing impact on the customer's decision. The customer's decision has an amazing impact on the profit of the company. The profit of the company has an amazing impact if it's sustainable on the future of the planet. Great, thank you for that, Dimar. I'm gonna read you this question from Marcus. Marcus, thank you. And then I'm gonna put up the CBA Advantage code while you're answering the question for our students. Um, what is the best solution for the U.S. to speed up its transition to electric vehicles? Do you think that a motor vehicle ban like the one in the U.K. will work for a market as big as the United States? I think there's always uh, two aspects. Everything has two motivators, and that is to reward the good <laughs> and uh, to stop the bad. And I think that uh, stopping the bad is very, very vital. And you can do it with various things. Um, for instance, if you, somebody, or the, the person asking the question mentioned the UK, uh, in, in Europe, uh, very often you cannot go into the city center anymore if you have a combustion engine car. So in order to drive to the city center or find even parking in the city center, you have to have either an e-vehicle or a bike or public transportation. Combustion engines are simply blocked. And that is a tough, tough action. But these things actually bring results on the uh, negative enforcement end. On the positive enforcement end, there's a lot of people that um, are emotionally re rewarded by e-vehicles and are really, really happy to, to, to drive an e-vehicle because they feel good themselves and their friends see that they are good as well. And I think this has to be incentivized by, for instance, a lowering taxes on e-vehicles and stuff like that. But always you have to have to the two ends. You have to have the reward 
and you have to have kind of the punishment because then you can actually grab it like this, boof, and squeeze the market. If you have only one end, if you only push the punishment thing up, people will come up with a solution against the punishment. If you only have the reward, people will find ways to uh, avoid the reward system. Only if it's up and down, the two ends, then you can actually squeeze the market and hold your target where you want it. Great, thank you. And one last question, and hopefully we can get to your slides. Do you think that there will be an overcompensation of production that will lead to a worse environment than prior to normal life? So this is as we open up. Oh, that's, uh, I think the, uh, what is that? The, the, the short-sightedness is gone. The, 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 the urgency of the net, natural catastrophes is very, very vis visible and very, very noticeable. And the demand from the market is also very, very visible. So I don't think that we will flip back to the way it used to be and just produce and produce and produce in order to have, uh, in order to have products. I don't think that the product itself, the value of the product itself is really, really getting lower and lower and lower. The physical value, there's no or hardly any physical need for products for another t-shirt. But there's an emotional need for those things. And if you feel good having a product, if you reward yourself, that will be, I think, the driver. And that's why I think that if we, if the, the, the market that is growing is not just production of goods, but production of quality goods and of sustainable goods and of goods that help nature and actually avoid also a killing nature. Great, well, thank you for yeah. that. Well, that, that's all of our questions for now. So we've got about four minutes if you want to okay, share let's... your other slides. Okay, let's see. <laughs> let's see where we were, we were here, job done. Perfect. So it's a never ending rodeo, right? It is always changing. The world will always changing. And who has to adapt to an ever changing world? You do, because you are riding the market. And if you don't do that, if you don't ride the market, you will fall off the horse and you will actually end in the dust and you will die in the dust. That's what happens if you don't change and if you don't adapt to the environment. But we don't want that, right? So let's simply rewind the thing and put the skeleton back on the horse and the uh, some flesh around the skeleton and let's look at how falling down actually works. The problem is that before you fall down, you are always at your highest point. If you're a business, before you fall down, you have the highest sales, you have the highest market penetration, and you're celebrating your success. The highest market penetration for black and white television sets was just right before color TV killed black and white television. The highest penetration for color TVs was just right before flat screen killed color TVs. Nobody had more color TVs at any time in history before it was killed. And the most number of flat screen existed right before the new technology will come and destroy this also, right? So the highest point is the most dangerous point because you will fall down. And this moment is called the Wiley Coyote moment. The Wiley Coyote moment is when you're already off the cliff, when you're already dead, but you don't believe you're dead yet. And that is the deepest fall. And this is the problem that I will not really show how Wiley e. Coyote always dies. You know that this is Wiley e. Coyote. If not just Google it, it's a character that always dies and never learns from this. And how do you avoid this moment? The thing is very, very easy. You have to look at what is happening at the fringes of the market. The charge, the change always starts at the fringes. We heard about Tesla. It was a fringe market, then it became a growing market, and now it is actually a main market. And that is where the disruption happens. So the new main market will be sustainability. And the fringe, it is already a fringe market, and it will just get stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. So if you want to be the biggest brand in the world, become sustainable. If you don't become sustainable, you are Wiley e. Coyote and you will die. Thank you very much. Fantastic. That was great, Dietmar. Thank you so much for your insights today.
And thank you everyone for joining us um, for our webinar. So, you know, it's so sad to say that next week we'll be concluding Dietmar's series, um, but this is where he's gonna impart knowledge to us on why Agile is king. So we're really looking forward to that. And, uh, you know, in the meantime, stay safe, everyone. And thank you again for joining us for Deep Mardana's injection series. So have a great rest of your day and we will see you next week.